Readers, reviewers, countrymen, lend us your ears. Welcome back to the Brothers Gwyn channel. We are very excited to be going back to our monthly updates of what we have read. It's my fault we didn't do one in May. I had exams. So I take full blame, full responsibility. So here is a delay. So first. <laughs> so here I'm is. Glad we've got it recorded. <laughs> You've got this as evidence against yeah, me now. Exactly. So this is going to be a video talking about what we have read in April and May combined. So it'll be quite a big video because Ed read a lot. Yeah, uh, it was the Easter holidays. Um, I had nothing better to do. I had two weeks off uh, and I might have read around 30 books. So when I was revising, each time I came out for a little break, Ed was just on a different book. I was yeah. like... I wish I was here. I was really yeah. in the zone. And then May actually hit me quite hard. Oh, there's so much work at school um, and it's been a busy one. Not as much reading, but uh, I've done a bit more writing, which is good. So that's fine. Yeah, so we can talk about that as well. And let's just dive straight in, shall we? Yeah. So the first book I read in all the way back in April now, two months ago, uh, was The Wolf of Wessex by the awesome Matthew Harvey. Now, Matthew Harvey is such a great guy. He's a really good historical fiction mm. author, focused mainly with the Viking Age period, um, kind of around the time of Alfred the Great, that era as well. Similar to those Bird of Cormar vibes as well, but really good. He's also written, uh, I think, um, a series called The Bernicia Chronicles, yeah. um, here, which is Vendel kind of period. Um, I think 7th, 8th century um, in Britain, which Very is, cool. I've only, I read the 8th book in that, uh, but I'm going to go back soon and read the first. <laughs> I just read the 8th book. Just I know, it was coming yeah. out and I thought, you know, they're kind of like Bernard Cornwall books, you can dip and dive into okay. them. But yeah, The Wolf of Wessex is a standalone uh, and I will describe it as um, true grit if John Wayne had a sword. Uh, that's the best way I can put it. Uh, without giving too much away. If you've read True Grit or you've seen either films, um, then you know what the plot is going to be similar to. Uh, but it's a great, great book, really good, uh, and I loved it. And the next book I read was a novella by Giles Christian called Hellmouth or Helmuth? No, oh, yeah, Hellmouth. It's Hellmouth isn't I it? think it's Mouth, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> and you will see why when you read it. Yeah. But, um, Giles Christian so is good, another historical fiction or, uh, author, and he's fantastic. And Hellmouth is is a bit of a later period than what he or I've mm -hmm. read by him. Uh, he's writing in the 14th century, a group of medieval knights similar to Black Death with Sean Bean. Uh, if you've seen that, and if you know Sean Bean's in it, you probably know what happens to Sean Bean at the end. That's not a spoiler. Um, but Hellmouth is really good. It's kind of a horror medieval vibe. Um, and I absolutely loved it. I listened to Philip Stevens' uh, Audible narration, oh, which is, narrate. and he's so sure. good. We are going to do a video soon with our favourite Audible narrators, mm -hmm. and he, I think, will be probably top yeah. of the list. I think the thing, thing with Philip Stevens and Hellmouth in particular is there's, there's quite a range of tone throughout. And I think terror, terror, <laughs> terror, terror, terror. <laughs> fear, Blood fear, fear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think that a lot of audible narrators, they know what they're great at and they kind of stick in that area. But Philip Stevens has just got it all. He can have the calm moments where you're taking everything in. Talking about scenery, it's all nice yeah. and everything. And then it's the only time I've actually been scared. Yeah. And that end. and that's a combination of Giles's writing, mm. but also just the vocals of Philip Stevens. Yeah. It's basically <laughs> Black Death meets Doom. I loved him. And a book that we both read in, not this month, April, um, is Dead Gods Rising, the placeholder name for the second instalment in the Bloodsworn saga. So we started this in March and we finished it in April when we were given the rest of the first draft. And oh it was one of those where we were reading it as Dad's still writing it and we're like, any more yet? Why are you out there? Like, yeah. You need to get yeah, right. make right. a cup of tea. We're like, no, no, no. Go, go to your room. I'll make the cup of tea. You go and write. But, um, oh my goodness. So good. Oh my goodness. Oh my word. So good. Honestly, this is incredible. We love Shadow of the Gods. And whilst our hearts are with Faithful and the Fallen, this is what I would say is his best written book. Mm -hmm. So the Shadow of the Gods came out last month. There's a lot of buzz and a lot of talk about it. And as that was happening... Well, as we had just finished book two and everyone was talking about what they think might happen it's just been so hard to just mm -hmm. keep, like when we did the jump. um the talk with philip chase and the other yeah. wonderful booktubers uh they were they had all these kind of ideas about what might happen in the second book and we're just like we're just looking don't ask us we don't know it's really really hard uh so yeah so dead Girls rising was phenomenal as always we trust dad and his writing um 
and we love the world of the Bloodsworn as well and we love talking to Dad about what he's thinking of doing next as well and after and oh, some big things anyway what else did i read uh, and another book i read is a viking age book as well um and it's called odd and the frost giants this neil is by gaiman. neil gaiman yeah and it's really really good i read this to my class it was we were doing vikings at school um so i of course i jumped in the opportunity finding to, any way to bring absolutely. any neil gaiman or anyone that you love in. yeah and uh, any books to read uh, in the viking terms which are t uh, term three and four and uh, it's great fun the class loved it i really enjoyed it um the um the illustrations are great as well and obviously neil gaiman's humor is wonderful and then I read The Sun by Philip Meyer, which was actually a reread. I did actually listen to this one, which was, and I loved listening to a book that I've already read before. Um, I just felt so more, e even more immersed as well uh, mm -hmm. in knowing exactly what was going to happen next, which was great. Uh, I absolutely adore this. I've been writing a Native American inspired fantasy, and this was, uh, this counts as research, and it's a great book to be able to research. Mm -hmm. um, Philip Meyer's writing about the Native American band, the Comanches, uh, is just groundbreaking and so vividly told. Uh, Brilliant book. I recommend this to anyone. It must have been very interesting listening to it after you read it last year, seeing that what you got from each one. I imagine it was very different, even though you loved them both. Yeah, exactly. Because last time I was always kind of begging, because there's three points of view here, and I was begging for the one that was with the Comanches. But this one, I was able to appreciate the other two a little bit more. And the character work in this is just genius. And it's basically a history of Texas um, told through three point of views. Uh, and it's just brilliant, set in, set in the wild the wild west. Uh, it seems pretty wild, uh, but I absolutely loved it. And then I did another reread of Blood Meridian. Now this is um, in my top two favorite books of all time. Cormac McCarthy is in my top three authors of all time. And um, this book is just phenomenal. It's absolutely amazing. Um, it just is so thought provoking and evokes so many feelings. Um, the portrayal of war and humanity mm. and the questions it asks the reader um, and the way you can uh, see the inferences within this and see kind of Cormac McCarthy's inspirations through literature through the ages. It's just, it is mind blowing. And the first time I read this, I was really taken back. And the second time, even more so. Um, I actually published on my, I, I wrote my Twitter as I was reading, writing down my favorite lines from this. And there were just so many. Um, the prose is the most beautiful I've ever read. And the violence is the most horrific I've ever read as well. Yeah. Um, and I think those two things together just make it an even more mm. unforgettable book. Yeah, it's not for the faint of heart, but it's a book that you should definitely read. Yeah, it's set in 1849, um, in just after the war between uh, the United States and Mexico. And this is where a group of filibusters, which were um, uh, people who uh, go into Mexico armed, uh, for combat without any orders or anything from any government, that kind of thing. Uh, and they go and they get paid by um, Mexican cities to take the scalps, um, which is pretty harsh, uh, of the Native American harsh indigenous tribes around there that are causing trouble. Uh, and it goes from that. And it, obviously that is a horrific, you know, premise. kind of premise anyway, but it gets even darker and, and somehow just horrible. And it is vile, really. Um, but it's well worth a read. I would, I would say, you know, if you're interested in any kind of storytelling, um, anything reading, really nice prose, or if you're interested in that kind of period as well, uh, then this will tick a lot of your boxes. And a book that I read in early April was Kings of the Wild by Nicholas Ames. This was wonderful. You read this when? In January, February, quite early yeah. in 2021. And since then, you've been prodding me with a stick to get started, and so has Papa Gwyn. And I really owe you one with this. This is one of my favourite books of all time. Straight away, no question, no doubt. And while at first I thought this might have some recency bias, a few months have passed since then and it's still there and I'm still smiling at remembering certain scenes. This is a book that just has it all. It stays with you. I, it? yeah, it really does. I love books that bounce off characters and they evolve and focus on character work. And Kings of the Wild really 100% does do that. The core crew, as you can see on this front page here, they're just awesome, aren't they? What a mix of characters. And I think that's something Nicholas Ames does really well, is just show what friendship really is. And he just shows it as being very natural and organic. And I just love that because you don't... I think it's quite hard to do that in a book where you have limited dialogue and limited travelling time with people because it's all often about the plot. And so I think that can often detract from characters. But Nicholas Ames hit the perfect balance here because the plot I thought oh with all this character work maybe the plot will suffer a bit 
I was wrong. Um, this the plot was just really engaging as well, wasn't it? It was really fun. There were serious moments as well. There were serious topics discussed. This was a really funny book, but I think again, just I'm using the word perfect a lot, but really in my eyes, it warrants it. And Kings of the Wild was just fantastic. One of my favourite books ever, and definitely in the running for my favourite book of 2021 so far. Good choice, Will. And my next book was uh, The Comanches, The History of the People by T.R. Ferenbach. Uh, this is a really good book, um, a, a non-fiction uh, about the tribe, the Comanches, which is my main interest. Um, well, one of my main interests anyway. Um, but it's yeah. a lifestyle. Yeah, not, yeah. It's not, not a phase. A, it's not a phase, it's a lifestyle. Um, so yeah, I really enjoyed this. This was good. Uh, it's kind of a, a bit, bit too much of an Anglo, um, white European bias maybe written about them. Uh, about the Comanches and the Native American tribes as well that were surrounding them. Um, but again, you know, it was still really interesting, uh, quite a riveting read, um, finding out kind of little details and seeing the sources as well um, was really interesting for me anyway, for someone who's trying to research mm. this. So yeah, this was a really good book. It's really, it's quite dense as well. Um, the style isn't exactly easy to get into, um, but you know, you're, I'm not reading this for the style, I'm reading this for the information within the pages and that was really good. And another book about the Comanches, no surprise here, is Three Years Among the Comanches by uh, Nelson Lee, who was actually a Texas Ranger in the, I think oh, it's wow. the 1850s, 1860s. Um, and he was captured by the Comanches and spent three years with them. Uh, now, I wasn't really keen on this, to be honest, because um, it says he was captured by the Comanches, but through my research, through what I know, uh, it doesn't sound like he, what, they were the Comanches. It sounds like they were actually the Apache tribe. Um, I've seen a few reviewers as well saying they think he was maybe a bit confused about the tribes. Um, obviously, the, you know, for a white person in that time to know which tribe and who they were um, must have been quite difficult because no one's really ever had a, an exact understanding of those cultures and they were also different. But when, as, soon, sorry, as soon as they said um, the Comanches were eating their horses, I knew yeah, it's not them because that sounds more like the Apache um, and the Comanches didn't eat their horses. Um, so anyway, that was just one thing. But yeah, I, he focused on himself because uh, this is actually written by Nelson Lee rather than about the actual Comanches. And I was reading this really to find out about the little details about how they lived, that kind of thing. But, you know, it's still worth checking out, um, seeing that a, a kind of a period mm. piece written back then. So it was interesting, but lacking the finer details. Yeah, exactly. Cool. And another book that I read in April was later by Stephen King. So his most recent release. And so I've only read one book by Stephen King before, and that is Salem's Lot. So, so I, was, good. I was planning on diving into Carrie after, but with the hype around this, my book review said that this was brilliant and a mm. step up from some of Stephen King's recent works. So the temptation drew me in, and I just had to jump on that bandwagon. And later, it was really, really great. I really loved this. Um, it goes from, it kind of bounces a bit off like Sixth Sense. So a kid who can see dead people. But a bit of a spin on it, he could only see them just after they've died for the next day or so. So this kid, he's a teenager, this book goes through his formative years, I think that um, Stephen King's very good at the Bildung's Roman format as you're growing up and they're yeah, the going coming to of adulthood, style, coming yeah. of age story. And it's very interesting how he looks at just normal life really. Um, and so his mother knows about it at first, she's not really sure um, uh, if it's true or not, but then he proves beyond doubt that it is. Um, and it's just about how he lives his life and it ends in a big climactic end. And I just thought that this was really well written, really engaging. I burned through this in a day or two. Also, I want to say that um, this is a bit damaged, even though I got it recently. And this is an excuse that not many other people can <laughs> bring up. Um, it was eaten partly by our lamb. Yeah, my lamb literally ate my homework. That Literally, that, yeah, yeah, I will do that. Um, yeah, so eating the corner, which I'm a bit sad about. I mean, lamb, but... she doesn't have top teeth. She only has bottom teeth, and she kind of gums slash gnaws her way. She loves books. She tried to eat one of the Shadow of the Gods the other day, and we were like, the lamb versus no! the dragon, who will win? Uh, yeah, Edith won. Edith won big time. Big time. But yeah, so we have to be careful of our books now because she may love them like us, but in a bit of a different way. Yeah, it's like on the Isle of Komodo, how the people who live there have to build their houses on stilts so the Komodo <laughs> dragons don't get in. We have to put our bookshelves on stilts now because we have a lamb. Just because. 
And another Native American inspired book is the Native American Mythology by Hartley Burr Alexander. And this just kind of goes through um, many different tribes and their beliefs. Uh, I think this was written in a really engaging style. It covered quite a lot in uh, not too many pages. Um, and kind of reflected on how each culture were a little bit different. Obviously, we don't know everything about the tribes. We know mostly about the Lakota, as um, the Lakota are kind of are still a very big presence in the United States at the moment. Um, so we know a little bit more through word of mouth as well. But but still, I think this is a really interesting read and well worth seeing how um, Native American cultures had different beliefs different mythologies and you know I love mythology from mm. Norse mythology to the Greek pantheon and this kind of gave me a, a whole new understanding and a, a new kind of thought process around how they are built and how people see them uh, see their gods and see deities and how they come up with stuff you know that, which was really good and I really enjoyed it so well worth a read. Getting on into the fantasy section then, so here we have The Fires of Vengeance by Evan Winter. Now, um, William, again, I prodded him with Kings of the Wild. He prodded I me. right back. Yeah, right back, yeah. He hit, hit me back, back at me um, with Fires of, the Venge Fires of Vengeance, not The Vengeance, although there is a lot of vengeance in this. Uh, and Evan Winter is a great writer, really good. I think this is a really good, um, engaging book. Uh, the plot is great you know the plot's great the characters are really good the combat is awesome um and it really is a whole whirlwind um uh, the character tau is a big force to be reckoned with he's literally too yeah. angry to die uh, literally too angry to even feel anything really apart from rage oh i um, I, I disagree with that bit but it, it just shows that you can get different things from the characters when you read the books yeah he's angry um, big time, um, but yeah. So he goes on big rampages, and you know I love I love the character Tao. He's really good. Uh, he's a little. He can be a bit frustrating sometimes, similar to Falcio from The Great Coats with his decisions and kind of his whole outlook. But um, I think this is a great book, and I really cannot wait for book three. Is it called the Burning? No, the Burning is the series. What's book yeah, three? Yeah. Uh, so the Lord of Demons. Lord of Demons. Ooh. Oh yeah! What a name! So I'm looking forward to that. This would be a great TV show, I reckon. If uh, Netflix picked oh, it up, this would really suit it. Absolutely. But yeah, loved it. I'm so glad I got to dive into the burning. Now we have to wait for book three. Uh, and then I read As I Lay Dying by William Faulkner. Now, to be honest, I don't think I was able to actually grasp much of what was going on in this novel. It was quite uh, confusing for me, anyway. Um, I think a reread is definitely in order. I didn't quite get what I wanted to out of it, but it was, you know, it's written beautifully by William Faulkner. People say that William Faulkner is a massive influence on Cormac McCarthy. And I love his writing, but um, but yeah, so it was interesting story. It's considered an American classic. I think it was written in the 1920s. Faulkner was kind mm. of the opposite um, to Hemingway yeah. uh, of styles, but they were in the same period. I think they had a bit of a rivalry going on. Um, but, you know, I think it's well worth a read. Um, a, a mother of a family dies um, through natural causes uh, or illness. And then the rest of the, the book of the, is about the rest of the family, which is a, a group of people. Um, there's quite a few of them taking her body um, on a cart, on a little journey, take away. Similar to how God of War starts, but how um, he has to take uh, his, yeah, exactly, um, Faye's ashes to the top of the mountain. Uh, but it goes into the different um, point of view shifts uh, and talk and kind of goes through how they feel about things and that, you know, their experiences as well on the journey as well. Um, it was a little bit slow for me, um, obviously, you know, lacking in plot, but I don't think it's written for the plot, it's written more for the style. Um, yeah. And I think a reread is definitely in order in the future. Yeah, um, you kindly got me a copy of this as well, so I'll hopefully be diving into that in the coming months. Yeah, I think you'll really like it. Okay. Talking of Cormac McCarthy, I then read Child of God by uh, the master himself. Now, uh, I saw the film of this by James Franco a few years ago, and I thought, what the hell did I just watch? <laughs> um, it's about a man um, called Lester Ballard who um, gets, he's kind of, a little bit of a loner and it goes from being a loner to being outside of society living on his own in the woods and how his mind deteriorates and he becomes when i say a little bit of a necrophiliac it's a bit weird i mean it's not pleasant reading um the prose is really nice and it kind of just the journey of the book it's a very short book i read it in about a day um it's it's very it's very weird um, you looked a bit shell-shocked. I was a bit shell-shocked. 
But I really enjoyed the portrayal or, you know, kind of seeing how Cormac McCarthy tackles um, people with this going on in their minds and how he portrays his characters. Again, you know, he's wonderful with his characters and it's just he comes up with ideas that I wouldn't even dream of. Obviously, the whole premise of this, I wouldn't even dream of at all. But, um, you know, I'm a big fan of Cormac McCarthy's work and this is set in Tennessee. Um, and he likes that whole kind of that that um, area as well within his writing as well. So um, I think it's well worth the read. It's very quick and uh, he is definitely a character writer and also beautiful prose as well. So it's worth reading just for those two on their own. What I read next was Rich the Third. I think this is the fourth time I read it in 2021. <laughs> Do you still love it? Whatever. It's still great, but it's a bit drier than the first time when you read it four times in quick succession. Um... So this was one of my set texts that I'd be examined on, which is over now, and I think I did all right in this one. Um, well, you read because... it four times. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> hopefully. Right. Um, at Richard III, I've said before, but if you've not seen the videos where I've talked about it, um, it is about a Machiavellian archetypal anti-villain, Richard III. Um, it's called a historical play, but I think it's more political. It seems to be a lot of Tudor propaganda because Richard III is a hunchback king who is evil, an evil murderer, um, who kills anyone who will go against him. And he basically has no good emotion. Um, but this is brilliant. I think it's just so clever. And the amount of dark humour in this, it just, I feel bad for laughing. Like, it's when he's talking to, like, his nephews, who's obviously there's a myth that he may have killed the princes. It's not proved, but in this, Shakespeare adopts the approach that he does do that. And there's a scene where he's with his nephews and they say, um, can I have your sword? And he <laughs> says, with all my heart, boys. <laughs> um, and That's it's good. just the subtext like behind that. it. You're just like, no, you shouldn't be laughing. And yet you are. And there's a lot of moments like that throughout. He is evil. You hate him, but you love to hate him. Um, and Richard Third was great. And I think it may be my favourite Shakespeare play maybe Macbeth or King Lear but anyway it's up maybe. there maybe we fit that in every video every single um, th yeah oh, this will is we? What... maybe maybe <laughs> um, this is one of my favourites by Shakespeare and so it was great to be examined on it and diving more into my research of the 19th century West uh, here is a dictionary of, Amer of Americanisms um, written I think in the 1860s I believe this it it is what it says on the tin. It's a dictionary of American sayings that people would say in the 19th century. And I may have started adopting some phrases into my own uh, everyday life, such as to see, the, to see the elephant means <laughs> to undergo extreme disappointment. I don't know why, it just does. So, um, so yeah, so that, that, that's just how I'm speaking now. So if I say a few little weird phrases, then it's not just my mind being strange. Well, it might be. Um, it's me trying to be a 19th century American. But yeah, this was really good just to get those kind of authentic period sayings and words as well. And it's also really interesting, quite a humorous read as well, um, even though it's, it is literally just a dictionary. So it, it obviously talks about the phrasings and sayings, but does mm -hmm. it say about where they came from or? Sometimes they do. Sometimes they say kind of what area of America or which author actually okay. started writing them. Obviously Webster is a lot of it because he wrote um, in the dictionary, didn't he? Um, but uh, to girdle a tree, to make a circular incision like a belt through the bark of a tree and kill it. So to girdle a tree. There you go then. I won't really say that much uh, in my life. <laughs> But hankering, I say that a lot as well, don't I? To hang up one's fiddle, to give up. Sounds very interesting. <laughs> this is what it does. <laughs> it's what I do. And the next read was Black Sun by Rebecca Roanhorse. And this was great. This was a fantasy book set in um, the pre-Columbian Americas. Kind of very much... Oh, am I boring you? It's fun. I'm sorry I'm Every yawning. video, you yawn. I don't know. There's just something about being in this room. It's quite hot. Um, but if I, I, but anyway, if I leave going. then it'll be really cold Yeah <laughs> Anyway Anyway Maybe hopefully I can get a sentence out now Without William yawning or falling I'm off. ashamed of myself Hang on, this will work <laughs> Oh, he's dead now Anyway, this Black Sun, Rebecca Roanhorse um, A fantasy tale Fantasy book uh, Set in kind of Mayan or Aztec 
um, cultures as uh, in a fantasy setting as well, which was really good. I love it. the the culture here felt so fresh. It's multi POV. Um, the the plot was really good and how they interweave towards the end and it set up book two really nicely. I don't know if uh, Rebecca has written book two yet, um, but I'm really looking forward to actually reading that one. But yeah, definitely if you want a fresh um, fantasy setting, which is different to many others. Obviously, I love reading um, medieval fantasy settings. But this just had something else that I haven't seen in any of those because it would be hard, you know. Obviously, I love to read history and you can see how Rebecca Roanhorse has taken on history within her setting, within her world. And I've written some really good, unique and excellent characters. Yeah, this is one of those. There's so many books that I want to read, but this is quite high up mm. the list. And another one that I hope to get to during the summer. Continuing with the tirade of books that I had to read for my assessments is we have Our Country's Good and you can see is that bringing this... bringing war flashbacks for you? <laughs> I'm getting a bit twitchy talking about this. Um, you can see that it's gone through quite an ordeal. I mean, I was taking my books with me everywhere. You I really spilled... didn't like this one. I spilled... <laughs> It's ironic because this is probably the favourite one of all my set texts, um, but I've spilled drink over it, I've ripped pages by accident, I've put a pen through pages I've been writing so frantically. Well hang on, that is a crime to many people who read books. I am really sorry, it, so. but I had to. See, I'm usually one, Ed folds the corners of his pages. I told you not to tell you people that. monster. No, but since I this... got some, some uh, bookmarks from the broken binding, I don't anymore. But it's just that you'd have it in you to do that in the first place. Okay, let's move on to you anyway. Um, <laughs> so I have an excuse that I had to have this for assessments, online key quotes. I had to, okay? There's no other way around it. But um, our country's good. It's set during the First Fleet, which is um, the first colonisation of Australia with convicts. Um, and commanders and officers to overlook them. And it's very interesting how it talks about crime... Um, and punishment is it about the punishment or rehabilitation and it also talks about is crime nature or nurture there's a, a lot of very interesting discussion in here um, and so this was really great to read um, and one that it doesn't offer you the answers and there's quite a lot of disturbing discussions in this um, a lot about power dynamics and how people can exploit power um, but this is really great and something I hadn't heard of until I was given this text to study. Um, so I would really recommend Our Country's Good to anyone out there. Very nice, thank you Will. And my next read was Assassin's Apprentice by Robin Hobb. I have actually read this before, I listened to it, um, but boy is it better when you read this. Um, Robin Hobb's prose is outstanding really. It's, oh, yeah. it's, it's, it's just so beautifully and um, Really poignant, actually, and I think uh, her character work is some of the best in the business. Mm -hmm. um, just how she, you know, she can write a, where two people are eating bread together, um, in both senses of the, of the phrase, uh, and they are, um, you can exactly see their motivations and the way they react to each other, and the relationships feel so real and so powerful as well. Um, you follow Fitz, who, are, oh, you just, you pity him. <laughs> Feels so bad yeah. for him the whole book, and he undergoes so much. Bless him. He's really, really uh, a sweet boy, uh, and he's getting older. And um, I won't go into too much of the plot, but I just, just Robin Hobb is well worth a read. The, this edition, for one, is stunning. Just you know, pictures mm. just like this. Um, are outstanding, um, and it's beautiful edition to read. Um, I love the way it builds up towards the end and fits. You can see how his journey is going to continue over the next two books of this trilogy. Uh, and I think it's going to take us for a wild ride. Um, I'd, and again, Robin Hobb's character work, not really much happened. I read the first 150 pages and I was like to Will, like, he was like, what happened? I was like, well, nothing really. But it doesn't have to but happen. But it's not about that. It's it? really not about, it's not about fast moving plot. It's about a boy's life and how he grows up, his attachment to animals, the animals in this are just written so heartbreakingly true and you know if anyone loves dogs then this is maybe not the series for you, maybe, maybe not, maybe, maybe. And April was indeed the Cormac McCarthy month. It so really was. That, that, wasn't I it? read No Country for Old Men and oh so good. Now if this was a spoiler talk I'm sure William would love to tell you the story but I mean basically I watched the film and I was like, oh, I love this film. I, this is outstanding. Um, this is one of the best films I've ever yeah, we watched. We watched about the first hour and 20 minutes. 
we had paused the film. Obviously, mum wanted a cup of tea, so we went and made her a cup of tea. Um, came back, we were like, oh, this film's amazing. And then the next scene happened, and I was like, what? This is the worst film something ever. Something bad happened um, yeah, to something a bad character, happens. and Ed just went... I this shut down. Terrible. Listen, I'm. I he was, went. He went Disney mode on us. I was Disney minded, but I'm. You know, I've read Jab Crombie since then. I've kind of come You've to terms with dark people dying, and this uh, this copy is beautiful as well. I love it. I love the cover. Um, but it's a great, great story. It's so, so um, amazingly told. And Chigger, Anton Chigger, Anton, yeah. yeah, Chigger is a brutally terrifying character, and it just. It makes you want to go write a villain, absolutely. It really yeah. inspires you. Um, but I don't think anyone mm. can write a villain as, no. as well as Cormac McCarthy mm. can. I mean, it's. I think it's not easy, but it's doable to make you hate a character. Mm. If they do anything bad to a child or animal, I hate them straight away. They're like the cheat codes in books, aren't yeah. they? Um, but to make you feel fear... Now, mm. that, that is rare. That is really hard. And the only Especially time I've, with such a dodgy haircut. The only time I've ever... <laughs> <laughs> How can you be scared of someone with that haircut? <laughs> or maybe it's because of the haircut. Yeah. Maybe. Um, for me, oh, the only two characters I've ever been scared of reading are Judge Holden and Anton Chigurh, both by Cormac McCarthy. McCarthy. Mm. So I'm not sure if I'd like to meet Cor um, Cormac McCarthy with that in mind, but he'd definitely be very interesting, and he is a genius. Yeah, he is. And uh, and this is just written in such a fluid style, similar to Child of God, really. It, Child of God was really easy to read, so is this. Blood Meridian is very hard to read and very hard to actually digest. Now, this is just so so brutal and so to the point, uh, and, you know, the variety of sentence structure as well, just to add to the fast-flowing nature of this book, where it really is just a torrent of darkness you know yeah and then i listened to the winter road by adrian selby uh, and just before william and i interviewed adrian selby he very kindly came onto the channel and talked to us about grimdark about dwarves versus elves and much much more he and his writing process was it was so good to to be able to talk to him yeah. and ask him questions really about interesting that and really get a you know just another understanding another layer um, if we go back to Shrek and his onions, um, of The Winter Road. And uh, it's a fantastic book, a really strong, sensual female POV who is not good, is not bad. She does what she has to in a world that is dark just to survive. And um, by the end, you're completely rooting for her. Um, there are some really amazing and poignant moments of this. Uh, it's really dark as well and brutal and bloody. Uh, and Adrian Selby is a writer that I just cannot wait to go and read more and yeah. more of. You know, he seems like he's really um, someone who tries to master his craft and thinks of these little details um, just to how to make readers feel rather than just writing mm. and then just submitting it. You know, he really thinks about his process. Yeah. And, and, you know, and he's such a great guy as well. So go, oh, so go much, check yeah. our interview out on the channel. And if you're interested, please do click on that link and buy The Winter Road, Brother Red or Snakewood. All three are in the same world, but you can read them in any order yeah if you like gerber crombie's dark setting um then this is definitely worth a read as well and all, all three of these books are standalone set in the same world i then listened to the long knives are crying um by joseph marshall the third now uh, i've spoken about joseph marshall on the channel before he wrote a book about crazy horse um the amazing uh, lakota sioux uh, leader uh, and The Long Knives of Crying is actually historical fiction set um, within the Lakota tribe of a character in Crazy Horse's band. Uh, and I absolutely loved listening to that. I think his delivery is really nice. Um, and just it's kind of another another uh, way of getting sucked into that immersive world of uh, the Native American cultures. You know, there's many, many, many um, different cultures in the way they believe and the way they act. It was all different to each other. Um, but the Lakota tribe... Um, was, it was amazing just seeing something more in depth about them and, and about those that kind of period as well around the Battle of Little Bighorn. And it is a series, so I'm looking forward to reading. I think there's another two in the trilogy, so I'm looking forward to reading both of them. And then I read The Gospel of Loki by Joe and Harris. This was, it's great, isn't it? Yeah, it's really funny. It's, it's just very funny. So obviously this uh, bounces and focuses on Norse mythology. but it's it takes proper very... Neil Gaiman vibes, Oh, it? definitely. Uh, but it takes a very unique perspective in Loki. I mean, that's just awesome, isn't it? I mean, we've all heard um, the tales of Norse mythology as if they're from some third-person omniscient narrator. Yeah, to take the focus of Loki, I mean, he's just hilarious, isn't he? And as soon as you know that, it's going to be a figure who is directly involved in all of these stories and so 
key to everything that happens. You know that it's going to be very interesting. And this really delivered. Um, you read this a year ago or yeah, about yeah. then and really enjoyed it and recommended it to me. And I felt that I needed just a dose of Norse mythology to distract me a bit from my revision. Um, in between reading Richard Third, I kind of just good all this. Um, so I listened to this on audiobook and I've forgotten the narrator's name. Do you remember Ed? No. But he is brilliant. Um, I'll make sure that I put his name in the description just because he deserves to have that attributed to him. He was really fantastic. One of the best narrators I have listened to. Probably the best other than Philip he suited Stevens. Loki so oh well. perfectly yeah. he what it, i could really tell that he sat down and he thought about loki's character his psychology and his delivery and it was just so perfect um this was a hilarious story that also had quite some key um uh, serious themes as well like it talked mm -hmm. a lot about ven vengeance and the idea <laughs> of whether it's worth it or not um and in the end you will see. It does it deliver. Yeah. Um, and you will see um, that this is really great. And then I read Blood Brilliant Notes On. Now, this is a collection of uh, essays and articles all about um, Blood Meridian, um, written from when it came out in the 1980s all the way to, I think, about 2010. Uh, and this is great, a great companion when you're reading Blood Meridian. Yeah. I read this afterwards um, and you can just... It, it mentions all the little details that you don't really think of and gives you historical details as well and sources as well, which I was mainly interested in, seeing the sources for Cormac McCarthy's research. Um, but even just things about mentioning how many times Cormac McCarthy writes about wolves in it and how he mentions uh, apes as well and other animals like that and how he mentions many different things. Well, it was just so interesting and in seeing how he, you know his metaphors come into play, how he begins chapters, how he ends them and all yeah. of this kind of stuff. You know, when it's a genius, it's like Cormac McCarthy. Yeah, there's it's so amazing much to, to read something like that. So much to digest as well. And um, you know, his his use of active verbs as well. And just you know, all of that's in here, many different things, even talk about, you know, his use of tarot cards uh, and the settings as well of the the um the whole bloody landscape of Mexico and the scalp hunting era uh, and and though you know the true characters that are in this because most of the characters in this are actually written in history so I would really recommend this if you read Blood Meridian it's definitely well worth a read maybe a companion piece as well. I then listened to American Serengeti by Dan Flores and this was actually narrated by Michael Kramer. Now I hear a lot of big things about Michael Kramer. I think he narrated Wheel of Time and Brandon Sanderson and I haven't really read any of those and uh, um, not really in my TBR to be honest. But um, Michael Kramer had a brilliant voice and it really suited this uh, this book, which is all about the uh, the animals on the Great Plains of America, around the uh, the area where the Comanches were raiding and living and, and trading and um, where they would ride around following the buffalo. But it also mentioned all of the different animals that lived around that period um, and, you know, the history of animals living uh, in on the Great Plains in America, which are, you know, central USA, uh, from Canada all the way down to uh, Mexico, New Mexico, Texas, that kind of that, those places, those states. Um, so it's really interesting, written really nicely in a nice style. It broke it up into chapters about, you know, one was about coyotes, one was about um, bears. You know, our oh, bears were so common in the Great Plains. And Lions I just never and tigers and bears. Oh my, oh, my. Oh, my indeed. And I just had no idea that, you know, bears would live, be able to, you know, live on this, in this environment of the yeah. Great Plain rather than wooded areas. I don't know too much about bear hunting, but uh, they weren't small bears either. So, yeah, really interesting. And Michael Kramer, what a great narrator.